You know, I've been preaching about Elijah over the past uh, couple of messages and uh, gleaning from portions of his life truth for you and I to apply in our lives so that we can grow and develop in our walk with God. And I'm going to be reading out of James chapter 5, verse 16. It says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much or has much power. And it goes on to say, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So here's a man who knew about the power of prayer. The entire land was changed because Elijah prayed. The spiritual atmosphere of the nation was transformed because Elijah prayed. And today I want to talk about prayer based on Elijah's prayer life because it is significant because James in the New Testament chose to draw reference to the prayer of this Old Testament prophet. That means his prayer or whatever we're going to learn from his prayer, Elijah's moment with God, is applicable to you and I here today. Amen? Will affect our prayer life as well. Prayer is the non-negotiable essential to your Christian walk. The foundation of every breakthrough you are seeking, every miracle, every change you want to see happen in your world, in the world of those around you, in our nation. The foundation is prayer. The foundation of every move of God is prayer. It is only prayer. John Wesley said it like this. He said, God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. Martin Luther said it like this, to be a Christian without praying is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. So if you're a Christian here and you don't pray, there's something terribly wrong with you. It's like being alive without breathing, which pretty much means you're dead. So if you're a Christian without praying, that means you're pretty much a spiritually dead Christian. So in Ezekiel chapter 22 and you see, based on the scripture, God is always looking for people who are willing to pray. Not only for themselves, but people who would stand in the gap for others, for the nation, for societies. In Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, God says, I look for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land. So I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. God was looking for someone who would stand before him and the land so that he didn't have to bring the judgment that the land deserved at that point of time. But he said he found no one. God is always looking for someone who will pray. Amen. You know, some of us have a mindset that, you know, God will do what he will do. So whether I pray or not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. Uh, that's not true. Yes, God is an all-powerful, almighty God. He's able to do anything, but he only works with our prayers. In Psalms chapter 115 verse 16, he says, The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So because he has given man the earth, or in Genesis, he says, let us make man in our image and get, let him have dominion over the earth. Let's give them dominion over the earth. What happens on earth is very much dependent on you and I. I know there's another scripture that says uh, in uh, Psalms 24 verse 1, the earth is the Lord and its fullness and the world are all those who dwell in therein and it may seem like a contradiction you know the earth is the lord's but the earth is also man's but it's 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 not a contradiction because both are absolutely true uh, let's say i buy a piece of property in a le on a leasehold land ultimately the land that property belongs to the government how many of you know what i'm talking how many real estate agents here please correct me if i'm wrong no don't correct me now correct me later peter you know if you buy uh, a leasehold property ultimately the land the property is owned by the government but and when the lease period is up they can take back the house and the land correct so ultimately the earth and its fullness belongs to the lord 
But he has given us dominion or he has leased the earth to you and I. But there will come a time when he will return and restore everything under his rule, under his righteous rule. But until then, it is in our care. So now, even though the land belongs to the government, because I now have ownership of it, the government cannot just come into my house without a permit, right? You know, I'll never return home one day and find Najib sleeping on my bed. <laughs> and Rosma fixing herself a sandwich in our kitchen. What are you doing? You know, I'm the government. I represent the government. All this is mine. I can come in your house anytime. No, it doesn't work that way. Amen. He can't do that. He cannot, even though he represents the government, he cannot come in without legal access or at the very least, an invitation. So the Bible says the earth and its fullness belongs to the Lord. The earth he has given to the sons of men. Though God owns all things, because he has given the earth to us, he cannot come in without legal access or at the very least, an invitation. And our prayers are an invitation to God to give him legal access into our world, into our lives, into our schools, into our families, into our nation. Every time we pray, we we are inviting God to invade what we have dominion over. We are inviting God to take over what was ours and give Him the Lordship over that situation. That's why we need to pray. Amen? That's why God is always looking for people who are willing to pray. People who would stand in the gap between the problems of man and the power of God and invite him into those circumstances. That's why God needed an Elijah. Amen? Elijah knew how to stand in the gap. He knew that his, his prayers would be a catalyst to, to bring about transformation and change. He prayed that it would not rain and it did not rain. He prayed again and it started to rain. And the best thing that the scripture says uh, in James is Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. It's interesting that this sentence is included in the scripture. The, the, the reality that this is a guy who was just like you. He was a man with weaknesses, with, with a characteristic just like yours. He wasn't Superman. He wasn't perfect man. He wasn't you the man. He was an ordinary you and I kind of guy. And the reason this, this portion is put into scripture is, is so that we realize that it's not about the personality, but it is about the prayer. The reason why James included this bit in this portion of scripture is so that we take our focus off the personality and put it onto the act of prayer. Amen? Because if we think it is about a personality, it is because of who Elijah is. It's because Elijah was such a, such a great man. Then, then what we do is we make the power of prayers off limits to you and I. We think there's no point of us praying because it was about the personality, it wasn't about the prayer. Amen? So in James chapter 5 verse 16, he says it's like this, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. And it goes on, Elijah was a human being with a nature such as we have, with feelings, affections, and a constitution like ours, he prayed earnestly for it not to rain, and no rain fell on the earth for three years and six months. So the miracle happened not because Elijah prayed. It happened because Elijah prayed. I said the exact same thing, but different emphasis. One my first, the first time I said it, the emphasis was on Elijah. The second time, the emphasis was on prayer. So just by shifting the emphasis, all of a sudden we realize, hey, it happened because Elijah prayed. That means the power of prayer is available to you and I. That means if you and I were to pray, were to believe and get into that mode of prayer, like Elijah prayed, we too can see God do great things in our lives, in our world. Listen, we can't all be Elijah, but we all can pray. Amen? Look to the person next to you, tap that person and say, you can pray. You can't be Elijah, but you can pray. 
this kind of prayer is accessible to all of us because the scripture reveals to us how he prayed, which is the key. Not just prayer, it says the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous person. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person. Not just the kind of prayer, but the kind of person. And I want to deal with that bit first, the righteous person, because a lot of people struggle with this. And, uh, and it is foundational to your prayer life because God says in Scripture that He only answers the prayer of the righteous. And you see this theme throughout Scripture. Only the righteous person He listens to. James chapter 5, verse 16, as we just read, the earnest prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayers. Psalms 34, verse 17, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them from all their troubles. Proverbs 15, verse 21, The Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayer of the righteous. So the key recurring word, that keeps popping up as a prerequisite to God hearing and answering your prayer is this word righteous. You have to be righteous to get your prayer answered. And the scripture is really saying is New and Old Testament, God will only hear you if you are righteous. And this is where many people struggle because they don't feel that they are righteous enough or good enough that God would hear them. So they feel that if I can get that pastor to pray for me. If I can get that prophet to pray for me, I mean, that prophet looks pretty righteous. If I can get Pastor Dale to pray for me, because I mean, he's got righteousness written all over him. Then God will answer my prayer. And many people don't pray because they don't feel righteous. They don't feel good enough or clean enough. And that's a fundamental flaw in your belief system. Because if you have given your life to Jesus and yet you feel that you're unrighteous, that means there's something wrong with your belief system. That means you don't understand the finished work of Jesus. You don't understand the power of His crucified body and His shed blood. You don't understand what the cross accomplished for you and I at Calvary. You don't understand what faith in Jesus Christ does for your life. Amen. God says he only hears the righteous. But you know, there's another scripture that says no one is righteous. For all have sinned and fallen short of his glorious standard. Romans chapter 3 verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. So if we think along those lines where God only hears the prayer of the righteous. And then he also says there's no one's righteous. Everyone's fallen short. That means we might as well listen all our prayers are wasted. It goes up. God's not going to listen to it. We are unrighteous. Nobody's righteous. So there's no point praying. We might as well just pack our bags and go home. So if you think along those lines, it is a waste of time. So you see, because righteousness is a prerequisite to God hearing you, and because no one is righteous, all have fallen short, not even one, the scripture says, God gives righteousness to us as a free gift the moment you believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He said, He made him, He made him who was righteous, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Romans 5 verse 17, For if because of one man's trespass, that reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace, unmerited favor, and, and what? Free gift. Next page. Free gift of righteousness, putting them into right standing with himself, reign as kings in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Righteousness is a free gift that is given to you by God. Amen? Amen. One more scripture on that. Sorry, messed up my notes. 
Romans 3 verse 21. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and in the prophets long ago. We are made right with God. How? By placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, for all have sinned, we all fall short of God, God's glorious standards, yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares, He declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins, for God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Your righteousness is a free gift from God. The moment you place your faith in Jesus, the moment you believe in God's only Son, the moment you believe that He died for you and He resurrected, and you were resurrected with Him, you are right. He made Him who knew no sin become sin so that you might become the righteousness of God. Righteousness is not about sinless perfection. It is about having right standing with God. And that right standing was bestowed to us the moment we accepted or we believed in the finished work of Jesus. Righteousness for you and I is not a standard we try to attain. It is an identity we learn to live out. Amen. We are not trying to be righteous. We are not trying to be righteous. We are not trying to be good. We are righteous. God already declared that we are righteous. We live out our identity. Amen. Praise God. Look to the person next to you and say, I'm a righteous person. So because you're a righteous person, your heartfelt prayer has much power. You can look at scriptures like in the one we read in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. Because you are righteous, his eyes are upon you right now. His ears are open to your prayer right now. You can look at scriptures like in Psalms 34 verse 17 that says, The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and know, and know that, listen, when you cry out because you are righteous, because of who you are in Christ, the Lord hears you. You can look at the scripture, the effective fervent prayer of the righteous person has much power and know that your prayer your effective fervent prayer has much power and can bring transformation and change every time you decide to pray God's ears are open to your prayers and his eyes are upon you amen you are the righteous person in Jesus name amen so now that that's settled we can go to the point that says the righteous person's prayer has to be effective or effectual the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous person has much power. The scripture says Elijah's prayer was effective. I'm going to read two verses. 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then in 18, uh, 1 Kings 18 verse 1, And it came to pass, after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, Go and present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. So in verse 17 verse 1, he's saying, God is saying it's not going to rain. And in verse 18 verse, uh, verse 1, he said it's going to rain. In 17 verse 1, he says I'm going to shut heaven. In verse 18 verse 1, he says I'm going to open heaven. Elijah prays according to God's word. But what's this about this rain thing that's going on? Why is this even happening? To understand that we need to go back years before to the time of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 13. And here's what it says there. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments which I command you today to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and your oil, and I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourself, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn away and serve other gods and worship them, lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you. 
He shall shut up the heavens so that there may be no rain and the land yield no produce and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. So Elijah didn't just think this prayer up. Elijah is praying based on the established word of God. What God had said to Moses years earlier. So he's reaching into God's word by the leading of the Holy Spirit and applying it into his present circumstances. In other words, his prayer was effective because he tied his prayer to the established word of God. In other words, if you don't know God's word for your life, you won't know how to pray. You'll have, you will struggle to pray effective prayer. Amen? God's word must be the foundation of your prayer life, of your prayer request. Don't pray vague, general prayers. Lord, bless me. God bless bless this food. Anchor your prayers on the bedrock of the word of God. Amen. Most of the time, vague general prayers go unanswered because it is untied to something God has said. God has promised to you in his word. Amen. God said this years before Elijah ever had to use it. But what God said all those years back was applicable to Elijah's present circumstances. Listen, there are promises in God's word. There are things that God has said in his word all those years back that are applicable to your present circumstances, that are applicable to what you're going through in your life right now, to the problems you are facing right now, to the things that we are going through in our nation right now. There are things that God has said in his word that are applicable. The reason we don't see rain in these areas or we don't see the blessings of God or the breakthrough in these areas is because we are not tying our prayers to the established word of God. Amen? For prayer to be effective, it must be based on God's established word. Don't just say, God, heal me. Say, God, I thank you that in your word, because of the finished work of Jesus in Isaiah 53, it says, by his stripes, I am healed. Right now, I claim that healing according to your word for my body, for my life. I claim that healing for my family. Tie your prayers to God's word. Don't just say, God bless me. Say, God, I thank you that I am the blessed of the Lord. Based on your word, your established word, you said that if I bring my tithes and offerings into the storehouse, you will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so huge into my life. And I claim that I bring my, my tithes and offerings into the storehouse. Lord, I thank you that your word promises that you will meet all my needs according to your riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Let it be unto me according to your word word. Amen. Pray the established word of God. Amen. First John chapter 5 verse 14. He says, now this is a confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything, he hears us. No. He says, if we ask anything according to his will, where is his will? In his word. In this book that you have six Copies of at home and hardly look at. His will is in his word. Find out his will for your life. That is why it's so important for you to pray, to spend time with the word of God so that you know God's will, not just for your life. Just when you know God's will, you know how to pray. Amen. A lot of people are praying without knowing God's word and God's will for their life. Amen. So going back to James, he says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain in the land for three years and six months and he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit three and a half years over three and a half years between the closing of the heaven because of the idolatry the word of god said that if the people were idolaters there would be no rain so the change with the rain only happened when the issue of idolatry was dealt with when Elijah dealt with it as long as there was idolatry in the land there wasn't going to be rain there, there are things that people need to address and change based on God's word there are things that people need to address and change before they see the reign of God come upon their life. Amen. Because a lot of people want the blessings of God, but they don't want God to change their lives. 
I want to remain the same. I want to continue to be idolatrous. But I want God to do something. But I don't want to change. I don't want to transform. I don't want my, my, my life to be disciplined in a certain way. Silence your phones, please. And uh, I spoke about this last week. Uh, you know, an idol is not necessarily a statue or anything in your house. It can be anything in your life that has more significance that you've play, given more importance to than God himself. It could be a person, a job, it could be stuff, it could be a career, it could be things or, or people that you're looking to to be your source. God won't share his glory with any idol in your life. So as long as there was idolatry, the situation didn't change for the people. So when you read God's word for your life, you'll realize that there are, in many cases, prerequisites to seeing the fulfillment of prayer in your life. We like reading, okay, God's going to grant you the desires of your heart. It says in Psalms chapter 37 verse 4. But no, it doesn't just say that. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and he shall grant you the desires of, our, of your heart. You know, we want God to grant us the desires of our heart, but we don't want to delight ourselves in the Lord. We can, we can read scriptures like in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. He says, uh, you know, uh, uh, we God direct. He said he will direct our paths. No, uh, he doesn't just say that. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. We want supernatural direction, but we are not willing to trust in the Lord with all our hearts. We are not willing to lean on him totally and completely and put aside our own understanding in some situations and trust God's perfect will for our life. Amen. John chapter 15 verse 7, it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. We all want to ask what we desire and we want God to do stuff for us, but we don't want to abide in him. We don't want his word to abide in our lives. If you abide in me, if my word abide, if his word is alive and living on the inside of you, then you will ask anything and it shall be done. Amen. Mark chapter 11 verse 25, it says, Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Whenever you stand praying, we want to pray and we want God to hear our prayers, but we don't want to forgive. We don't want to forgive our brothers, his trespasses. We want to hang on to our, to our anger, to our unforgiveness, but we also want God to hear our prayers. And it doesn't work that way based on scripture. Amen. First Peter chapter 3 verse 7, it says in the same way, okay, I like this one. In the same way, your husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are. But she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. And this is a bit you need to get. Treat her as you should, so your what prayers will not be hindered. And all the women said, Amen. Come on. And all the husbands said, Amen. I, That's in scripture. I didn't make that up. Husbands, treat your wife properly so that your prayers will not be hindered. Amen. There are certain prerequisites that you need to address. If you want to see God move in a powerful way, answer your prayers for your life. Amen. Effectual prayers, the effective fervent prayer of the righteous man has power. Effective prayers has to be based on the full word of God, not on the partial word of God, that bit that you like. It's the fullness of God's word. Amen? The effective, fervent prayer. First Kings chapter 17, verse 1. God said it's going to rain. 18, verse 1. God said it's not going to rain. James 5, 17. And it says, Elijah was a man with a nature. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain in the land for three. And then he prayed it would rain and it rained. In First Kings 17, verse 1 and 18, verse 1. God said, 
And in James 5, 17, it says, Elijah prayed. If God already said that it was going to happen, why did Elijah still have to pray? And this goes back to what I said at the start. God needed a man to pull it down, to give it access on the earth. God's decree had to wait on someone to pray it down. He said, even though God has decreed things over your life, you seeing it come to pass is dependent on your prayer, on your pulling down the promises of God for your life. How did Elijah pray? Uh, he says Elijah prayed effective prayer. He prayed fervently. What did fervency look like to Elijah? 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42. Ahab went up to eat and drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down to the ground and put his face between his knees. What did fervency look like? Fervent prayer look like to Elijah? He went up to Mount Carmel. He had a place of prayer. He went to a place where he could give undistracted attention to prayer. He had a place of prayer. Many of us pray on the go. We pray as we are in the car. You know, we pray, you know, just over dinner. We say prayers when we are walking, when we're in the office, you know, uh, you know, over lunchtime, a quick prayer. You know, pray, pray God bless our food. We pray on the go. We need to have a place we, where we can go to and give undivided, undistracted attention to the work of prayer. Amen. We all need that place that we can go to. You must have that place where you can spend quality time with God. A dedicated place where there's no distraction. So Elijah, God said that it was going to rain. But that wasn't enough. Elijah goes to a place where he could spend time praying the word and the will of God into being. Amen. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 6, it says, But you, when you pray, go into your room, go to a private place, and when you've gone in, shut the door. Why does it say shut the door? Shut away your distractions. To some of us, it's not about shutting the door. To some of us, it's about shutting the phone. Because you can go into your private place, your, play, your prayer closet, your room, but you still got the whole outside world in there with you on your phone. And every time the beep goes off, you're hurrah, bala, bala, beep, beep, hurrah, bala, bala. I reply to this WhatsApp message, oh, it's an urgent. Hurrah, bala, bala, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Teen, teen. Okay, I'll just answer this call. Uh, hold on. We don't tell hold on to the phone. We tell hold on, God. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. I'll be there in 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes. I'll call you back. Shut the door. Some of us need to learn how to shut that door. The door of distraction that's there with you in your place of prayer and give undivided attention. What did fervency look like to Elijah? Elijah had a place that he went to where he could give undivided attention to prayer. Amen. It says, uh, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. This was also the secret of Jesus' powerful ministry. Jesus often went away by himself where he could be undistracted by the things and the people around him to pray. Luke chapter 5 verse 16, it says, He himself often withdrew into the wilderness and pray. We need to have that place where we can withdraw into. Amen? If you don't have, find that place. Make that place. Could be a room, could be anywhere in your house. But just a place where you can go into fervent prayer with God. So he didn't just have a place of prayer. It says he had a position of prayer. He bent down and put his head between his knees. I tried that. It just doesn't happen. Without me feeling some snaps on my back. But it's interesting that it sounds like the brace position. You know when you're in the airplane and... Uh, 
and they tell you if there's any emergency, if the plane's gonna seems like it's coming crashing down, put your head. How many of you have heard that? Put your head between your knees, put your head down in front of you between your. I don't know how that will save you when your plane is coming crashing down from thirty-five thousand feet. But they tell you to do that. Put your head between your knees. And, but basically, it's a position that you go into when there is nothing else you can do. There's nothing else you can do. Go into that position. Elijah is in that position. In prayer, because there's nothing else that he could do but pray. So this isn't so much about the position of the body as it is about the position of your heart in prayer. The scripture says he prayed earnestly. Earnestly means serious in atten- intention, purposeful, in effort, zealous with depth and sincerity of feeling, passionately. In other words, he prayed like his life depended on it. How badly do we want to see the miracle of God come into our world? Time for us to pray earnestly when we go into that place of prayer. Pray earnestly. Pray like your life dependent on it because there are some things you're praying for and it's true, your life does depend on it. Go into that position of prayer. He had a place, he had a position, and he had a persistence in his prayer. It says, you know, I spoke about this last week. It says he sent his servant to check. The servant comes back and says, you know, nothing. And then he says, go again. And then the servant comes back, he says, nothing. He says, go again. And until the seventh time he goes back, he says, I can see the cloud the size of a man's hands. You know, there are some miracles that happen immediately. I've seen in my life, there are some prayers we prayed for and almost like instantly that it's answered. But there are some miracles that we are believing for where we have to keep at it. We have to go again. We have to, like I said last week, push, pray until something happens. Amen. Like Jacob, we've got to hold on. You know, when Jacob wrestled with God, he said, God, I will not let you go until you bless me. We've got to go into that kind of a prayer, that persistence. I'm not going to let go of this. I'm not going to get out of this position of faith. I'm not going to get out from this position of prayer until I see that miracle come to pass in my life. The Bible says we must pray with persistence. The Bible talks about keep knocking Keep asking, you know, and and it's not just a one-off knocking, asking and seeking. It says keep at it until you see the heavens move and invade your circumstances. That's the kind of prayer that we must pray for our nation. We haven't seen the circumstances change uh, drastically yet, but we got to keep praying, keep believing because God is moving. Our prayer builds a bridge. You know, uh, you read the book of Daniel. And you see how Daniel was praying and, from, and, and when the angel finally comes to him in answer to his prayer, the angel says to him, from the moment you set your heart to pray, I have been sent by God. From the moment you start praying, God's already prepared the answer. He says, but there were things, there were hindrances for me in the heavenly realms. And there were, there were demonic forces that came against me that tried to prevent me from bringing the answer. We don't know what's happening in the spiritual realm when we are praying. We can't see, but listen, you got to keep praying. Daniel didn't shift from that position until he received that answer. We got to stay in that position until we see that answer come in our lives. There are battles going on in the spiritual realm that we don't see, we don't understand, but there are battles being fought and won on your behalf as long as you stay in that position of faith, as long as you stay in that position of prayer. Amen? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12, it says, follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. It's not just faith. Faith has a partner. It's always called endurance, persistence, patience. Keep at it. 
keep at it this is you know not a sprint sometimes your prayer life it's a marathon you got to keep at it you got to have the endurance to keep at it until you see the breakthrough comes amen the effective fervent prayer of the righteous person makes much power available what did fervent prayer look like to elijah when do you stop praying about it when you see that cloud when you see that breakthrough as long as you haven't seen it yet it doesn't mean it's not coming it doesn't mean god doesn't want to give it to you it's it just means that you have to get back into that position of prayer you have to go again you have to stay in that position of faith until you see it happen elijah fervent prayer made a difference fervency he had a place he had a posi position and he had a persistence until he saw that shift come to pass in his life.